Hello my friends and welcome back to Gardo Goes Geek. On today's episode, I thought it might be fun to take a look at a movie that has recently celebrated its 25th anniversary, that was famous for launching a science fiction franchise, and yet was critically divisive when it released. In fact, it is only its reappraisal over these last 25 years which have led to it becoming considered the cult classic that it is today. And that film is Starship Troopers. Why was it so divisive? How was it reappraised? And why is it so beloved now? I hope you'll join me as I explore and aim to answer all this and more. So, well, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the Starship Troopers film... Um, a lot of people may or may not be aware of the book. The novel, Starship Troopers, is by Robert Heinlein. Um, it, he is a very noted science fiction author um, and a former military officer himself. He was a naval officer. And I think he actually fought in World War II or was in the Navy not long afterwards. And... You know, his whole thing was, you know, he he was very proud of military service. He was not necessarily conservative um, and not nationalist in the way that that word seems to have taken on, um, you know, the sort of connotations that word's taken on nowadays. But very, you know, definitely more patri- uh, patriotic. Um you know, he broke into mainstream magazines in the late 40s. He was one of the best science fiction novelists for many decades. He's considered, you know, he was quite famous for using a lot of hard science in his books. Um, you know, he, he was a, a stickler for scientific accuracy and trying to make sure everything worked. And that was his whole goal. And between him, Isaac Asimov, and Arthur C. Clarke, they're basically like the big three of um, science fiction authors in this period, in sort of the you know the late forties, early fifties. You know the 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 writers who were creating bold new works and essentially founding, um, you know the the modern genre of science fiction, sort of as as it's modernly understood. You know, I've spoken before about how the first real science fiction novel. Um, I think most people ag- would agree is uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and obviously you had people like um, Jules Verne, John Wyndham, and H.G. Wells decades before these guys. But sort of the modern idea of science fiction was Heinlein, Asimov, and Clark. Now they all sort of got their their start working in um, magazines and getting getting their work published that way. Um, Heinlein published several um, novels that are generally considered as the Heinlein Juveniles. Um, they were published for a publisher called uh, Shribner's, uh, Charles Shribner's Sons, um, which was an American publisher, and they were put in their young adult line. And each of the books generally features a, a young male protagonist, um, going out into the adult world for the first time, dealing with conflict, responsibilities, things like that, but usually in a background of a quite advanced scientific idea, uh, you know, and usually involving space exploration. You know, there's books like um, Space Cadet, Red Planet, um, The Star Beast, Tunnel in the Sky, Have Space Suit, Will Travel. Uh, and there's about 12 of them that are all published um, between 1947 and 1958. Starship Troopers is generally considered the 13th of the Heinlein Juveniles. However, it wasn't published by Shribner's. Uh, it was published uh, by Putnam's Sons, um, which is an imprint of the Penguin Group. Now... It was first published as a two-part serial in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction as Starship Soldier. And it's set in a future society 
where the human interstellar government has been dominated by uh, the military elite. And it is called now called the Terran Federation. And under the system that they have put into place, only veterans of the military enjoy full citizenship, which includes the right to vote. The narrative of the book follows uh, Johnny Rico, uh, Juan Rico, he's a Filipino man, um, throughout his service in the military arm of the mobile infantry. Now, he goes from recruit to officer um, against, you know, during an interstellar war against um, an alien species called the Bugs or the Arachnids. And mixed in with the book are a whole load of classroom scenes in which he discusses a lot of philosophical and moral issues um, with his contemporaries, which include ideas like uh, suffrage, uh, juvenile delinquency, civic virtue, and of course, war. You know, this is a war story after all. Now, a lot of these discussions have been described, rightly or wrongly, as expounding Heinlein's own political views and you know this is a very pro-military book because Heinlein has a background in the military you know um and as a result this this book is very pro-military it kind of glorifies them quite a lot um you know almost in a way very similar to at least a recruitment video, if not an outright propaganda tool. Um, And obviously, you know, the fact that, um, you know, military service and government service is a requisite to the right to vote um, in this society, you know, is also ascribed to being very fascist. Now, Heinlein, I don't think, is a fascist. Um... You know, he may have very definitely been a man of his time. Like, there's a lot of his um, depictions of gender and um, especially racial epithets in his work in the ways that the aliens are described are quite awkward. Um, You know, and that's true of a lot of his books and unfortunately is something that mars quite a lot of the early um, pinnacles of science fiction. Um, Starship Troopers, obviously no exception in that regard. Um, but I don't think he's a fascist. I think, uh, a lot of other people are exploring the idea of what would happen if you limited the right to vote to a certain group of people, for better or worse. And, you know, because he does take approaches like that in his work he comes up with um you know bizarre you know ideas and and works of a way to to use them and explore them um you know for anything else i think people could say about heinlein he does try and explore the ideas he comes up with now i'll be honest i've not finished starship troopers um i have tried to read it but it's one of those a lot of the ideas that it puts forward i fundamentally disagree with you know i don't like the 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 idea that you know the lack of discipline leads to the moral decline you know the advocation of of corporal and capital punishment in it you know the 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 trend of militarism i'm i'm very anti military i i do not like i don't think military is necessary um and if we do have one i'd much rather it was something like starfleet than the mobile infantry you know <laughs> to to use another science fiction allegory um you know i don't want a military that's there to fight wars i want a military that's there to keep us safe as we explore you know security force a police if you will but again not how the police in the real world actually are 
But that's another discussion. Um, now, I don't... I think some of the ideas are, are very good um, in the in the novel. And the way the, the mobile infantry are described, like they're given these suits of very high-tech powered armor. Um... You know, and the the war itself is quite interesting. They take a take out a raid against a colony held by the Skinnies. Um, you know, the Skinnies don't really appear in the films. Um, they do appear in the Starship Troopers cartoon series. Um, but you know, and the, the the raid is brief, but it's like it's it's quite bleak you know that they they lose people um and then it flashes back it's got a very disjointed narrative flashing back to the classroom and before service and you know going through to the modern day it's it's an interesting an interesting plot um but yeah it was a lot of the classroom stuff that i found really hard to get through um, and you know the the whole idea of violent conflict and militarization being inevitable, but not just inevitable, but necessary, um, and not even a necessary evil. Like it's a necessary virtue almost to be militaristic, and you know I get where Heinlein was coming from. Heinlein was a military man. He has, you know, I think he was a Navy man, but he, he, he would have had a sympathy for the, the whole idea of the poor bloody infantry, you know, the, the, the poor soldiers on the front line. And, you know, he, he would want to honor those sort of people, but, you know, the idea of kind of, struggling for survival based on strength it's very social darwinist and and not something i'm a fan of but anyway the reason why i'm setting this context up is because the film is a complete reaction to it now I'm not saying that Starship Troopers is without merit. I think if you are a fan of the Starship Troopers novel, fair enough, fair play to you. Um, you know, I'm I'm curious to see what you enjoyed about it. I struck, like I said, I struggled with it. I I don't think I finished it, and it's rare I don't finish a book, especially one if I'm enjoying it. Um, but yeah, while there was there were things I liked, definitely. Um. There was a lot I didn't. Like, the idea as well, there was an idea as well in this that, you know, you have no inalienable rights. And it's like, I get the idea of wanting to, to fight and die for your rights, but I do think people have certain rights, like, by nature of existence. <laughs> you know, you have a right to certain things. Um... But yeah, it's just a complete clash between myself and the author. But, you know, the novel did win the Hugo Award in 1960. It's, you know, continually acknowledged as one of the best and most influential works of science fiction, for good or bad. Um, and, you know, it's been... You know, and then it was it was after this that Heinlein went to to much more serious and much more involved writing. You know, his his next one of his next books was Stranger in a Strange Land, which is I, th I think if you're going to read some of Heinlein's stuff, that's a lot more of an interesting concept and a lot less overtly militaristic. Because yeah, you can definitely make the argument that this book is fascist, um, whether. Heinlein himself was fascist or not, the book reads of a fascist society. And that is the approach that um, that the film took. 
the film took the approach that Starship Troopers is, is fascist, almost. Kind of. Starship Troopers, the film, began development in 1991. It was written by Ed Neumeyer, and it was based on a separate project. He, he created his own script, and he called it Bug Hunter Tau Outpost 7. And it was meant to be a straight-up military story versus giant bugs. Um, nice and simple. However, one of the producers noticed that it had a lot of similarities to the novel of Starship Troopers and suggested that they rework the script to more closely follow the novel and then gain more inf interest from the studio executives because, obviously, book adaptations tend to go better than original ideas. You know, you have the name recognition, if nothing else. But it was the idea that this would have been an expensive project. And, you know, while there was definitely, you know, there was definitely huge advances being made in special effects and, and making things more cost effective, the mid-90s was a time where there was a lot of um, big budget movies. You know, it was, it created a lot of competition and, you know, eventually this got filmed and it was expensive for the time. It it ran on a budget of about 100 million, 100 to 110 million, about half of which would have gone to all the effects budget, you know, especially the, the effects that to create the arachnids. And I do think it's money well spent because I think they look very, very good. And they a lot of the visual effects in this still hold up quite well, I think. Um, you know, there's one particular shot um, about two-thirds of the way through the film um, where it pans out over this battlefield that's swarming with bugs. And they all look very, very good. <laughs> and, the, you know, I, I think back and I'm like, every single one of those would have been individually animated. You know, this isn't the era of Lord of the Rings Massive, where you had this this crowd animation algorithm. You know, they would have all been animated separately. And, you know, they're, they're bugs, they're insects. They don't have a traditional skeleton. You've got to come up with a, the whole way for them to move. It's very impressive still. But... Um, the most interesting thing, uh, for me is the fact that Ed Neumeyer and Paul Verhoeven, the director, made, took a very interesting approach with this film, which was the approach of developing it almost as a parody. Now, Paul Verhoeven is another big name in science fiction. He's worked in, um, you know, he worked on Robocop and also worked on Total Recall, both very, very good movies. Um, you know, he also worked on films, you know, the more exploita exploitative films, uh, Basic Instinct and Showgirls. So... You know, he, he has a talent for making an exploitation movie as well. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of positives in exploitation cinema. I know things like um, black exploitation is it's sort of used as a bad word, but some of those movies are very good. Um, you know, especially the ones that are trying to be uh, subversive and, you know, trying to do something different. And I think that's that's true of a lot of Paul Verhoeven's work. Something like Showgirls is not a good movie, necessarily, but it's definitely trying to say something. Doesn't always work, but it is trying to say something. Um, and I think that's also true of Basic Instinct. Basic Instinct, again, based on... Uh, I believe it's based on a novel, or at the very least the novel came afterwards, because I've definitely seen a novel on it. Um, no, apparently it wasn't a novel, it was a, an original story. Anyway, but that's also another one that's undergone critical re-evaluation. 
um, you know, being described as something that's evolved a lot better. I think that's true with a lot of Verhoeven's work. People kind of look back on it and it changes as it goes on. Um, but anyway, Starship Troopers. I'm, I keep getting distracted. But Starship Troopers um, is... What Paul Verhoeven decided to do... Now, Paul Verhoeven is um, a Dutch filmmaker. Um, you know, and... He was very aware of the Nazis and the effect that they had during the war in Europe. Um, and so... He wanted to sort of subvert the film by by changing it essentially. Um, you know, his his idea was to to change the film and make it something that almost parodied and lampooned some of the more fascistic elements of this society the the you know the terran federation that's being presented in the story and it is a bold very very bold move because you are taking a a book a very influential book that is critically lauded as one of the most influential in its genre and making a movie that essentially adapts but also parodies a lot of aspects of it. It's a very dangerous tightrope to walk because what you are doing is basically making a statement saying that you know, you are having an idea that is better <laughs> than, you know, the idea that you've had with this story is better than the original story. That you're correcting something in the original story almost. And I think this, this it works because this is almost the essence of deconstruction. The idea of deconstruction is, you know, taking something, tearing it down, and making something new. Um, you know, I've spoken a lot about comic deconstruction. Um, you know, Dark Knight Returns is a deconstruction take on Batman. It starts with a very classic Batman and then deconstructs him in every way, both through the character and through the art, to symbolise this to deconstruct him and become something more dark and gritty and almost absurdist as well. <laughs> That's There's elements of that here in Starship Troopers. Starship Troopers, Paul Verhoeven and Ed Neumeyer kind of realised that a lot of the elements of the book that they were drawing on, a lot of the elements of the Terran Federation, the war, the characters you know, the, the military, it was very fascistic. I'm not even sure if that's a word. Very fascist, basically. And so they decided to lampoon it. And the way they decided to do this was by creating a film populated by you know, gorgeous actors, for the most part. In fact, no, all very good-looking actors, every single one of them. You know, actors that look like models, essentially. Even Jake Busey he looks like a model. Actors that look like models, playing strong, capable young men and women, but not necessarily great actors shot in a way that makes them look heroic and badass, even when they lose, you know? Well, because when they lose, they still survive. Very few of them, the main characters, die. 
In fact, of the, the main characters in the narrative, the main five, I think two die throughout the course of the, ster- of the story. And, you know, it puts them in, you know, puts them in jeopardy, puts them in difficult situations. But, you know, has them just being there, being who they are, existing and winning. And it works because what it essentially does is it makes the whole film look like the sort of propagandist film that this society would have created. That's what Starship Troopers is. Starship Troopers, the film, looks like the sort of film, the sort of promotional film that would exist in this universe. Both, and as a result, becomes almost a critique and a commentary of that world itself, made by people who really did not agree with a lot of the elements of the novel that they were being told by producers and studios to use. And what that means is they created something subversive and different and something that adapts but also like i said deconstructs and tears down the novel while also kind of sort of holding a mirror up to it and saying this is the ugly thing that you are this is what you look like and i think that's very clever you know we like to talk about film adaptation and you know, what makes a good adaptation, what makes a bad adaptation. I think, personally, Starship Troopers is one of the better adaptations I've seen, completely because it doesn't adapt the story one for one, and instead adapts the world in a way that makes the film almost a parody. It's very clever does mean there's a lot of cool things missing like we don't get the power armor but we get a lot of other good things so that's how they adapted the story but how did the movie end up would you like to know more i'll expand a bit more on the development of the film in a bit and how i think that is part of what's led to its reappraisal. But let's just talk about the film itself. The film is relatively simple. Um, It's the 23rd century, which is not quite as advanced as the 700 years later time frame of the novel. Um, Earth is governed by the Federation. Um, I think it's called in the, in the, in the series, in the film, the United Citizen Federation. Basically, it's it's exactly the same. It's a military government, um, you know, democracy, quote, brought civilization to the brink of ruin. And so veterans took control. And only through federal service, um, usually military service, do you get certain rights, including the right to vote and the right to breed. And a lot of other votes are withheld from ordinary civilians. Now, humans have spread into the galaxy. They've started colonizing planets. And they've come into a race, into conflict with a race of insectoid creatures called the arachnids. Or as they're generally called, the bugs. And, you know, the the arachnids are, you know, they're an insect-based society. Um, but the humans in the Federation treat them very derisively. They treat them as almost like animals, like insects. But there's a lot of implications that the arachnids are way more advanced than that. Now, the film starts in this, you know, high school, um, where, again, everyone looks like a model. Um, You know, it's the main cast is, you know, we're we're introduced to Johnny Rico, played by Casper Van Dien, um, Carmen Abanez, played by um, Denise Richards, and Dizzy Flores, played by Dina Meyer. 
um, as well as Carl Jenkins, played by Neil Patrick Harris. They are all in school together. They all plan to sign up and join military service. Carl is psychic, so he goes into intelligence because he, he's psychic and he has the, the aptitude for it, um, you know, as well as also the, the scores. Rico, not so intelligent. Um, he ends up in the mobile infantry. His girlfriend, Carmen, goes into um, the fleet. Uh, she wants to become a pilot. And, you know, they're all planning to... Well, Carmen and Johnny are both planning on entering for minimum term service. And, you know, it causes a row with Johnny's parents when he leaves home. But, you know, he, he joins the military and ends up at training a boot camp while he's there. Dizzy, who has a very obvious uh, crush on Rico, um, joins his camp as well. Um, she specifically requests a transfer to be with him and, you know, his unit, um, which he cottons on and saying, you know, you're here for me. And she's like, I'm here for more than you. Um, you know, she wants to, she wants to be the best apparently. And, and we go through the boot camp scene that, you know, the, the trained up Rico shows early promise. However, he gets one of his, um, one of his colleagues, one of his fellow cadets killed in a live fire exercise, gets punished for it by being whipped. Um, Carmen is working with a co-pilot, an educator called Xander, who they encountered when they are in high school. He came in from another school for a, a football match. Well, like a, yeah, sort of American zero G style football. It was very weird. Um, and yeah, so that's Xander. Um, Xander and Carmen get close. Carmen loves being in space, being part of the fleet. She's signed on a ship called the Roger Young, um, which is also in the novel. Um, and she is very much enjoying it. She says she wants to stay and go Korea and become a pilot, become a captain. And obviously this message means that she won't be able to leave she won't leave after a term of service and come back to with Johnny. So Rico, you know, obviously that that affects him as well. Um, but at that point, just as he's considering leaving after being flogged, um, you know, realizing that he may, he maybe doesn't have what it takes, um, a asteroid crash lands on Buenos Aires, their hometown. And completely destroys it. Millions are killed, including Johnny's parents. Johnny has no home left. Rico decides to stay in the mobile infantry, and you know his unit are posted to the front uh, and sent as part of a military drop force to Clendathu, the uh, Arachnid home planet. Um, they land and then proceed to get massacred. Um, in fact, that's actually the first scene in the film is the landing at Clendathu, and then the film winds back. Um, the film, it, it's not quite the same disjointed way as the, the novel, um, but it's very similar. Um, and it's, it's very good, don't get me wrong. Um, the... So Rico is badly wounded, and he, Ace Levy, played by Jake Busey, and Dizzy are reassigned to a new group because most of their cadets that they were with were wiped out um, during the Battle of Clandathu, including one of their other friends. Um, and they get assigned to the Special Forces Unit, the Roughnecks. Now, the Roughnecks is led by their old high school teacher, uh, Razchek. Uh, I think it's called Razak in this. He's had like multiple different names. They can't seem to ever adapt his name correctly. Um, but yeah, the the leader of the Roughnecks, and you know the they get a new military commander after the what happens on Clandathu, like a, a new head of government essentially, um, who wants to create a new plan and. You know, they go back to the front lines now as part of the Roughnecks. They carry on fighting, 
Rico gets favored by uh, Razak. And, you know, when Razak ends up killed, Rico ends up assuming command of the Roughnecks. And it, it's pretty good. Um, you know, they find out that there may be uh, a more advanced bug, a brain bug. And so they, the movie ends with their mission to capture it, um, which they're sent on by Carl, who's now um, a colonel, like a head of military intelligence. And, you know, during the final battle, um, loads of stuff happens. Dizzy ends up killed. Um, Carmen um, and Xander crash land in the bug hive. Um <laughs> Xander is killed by the brain bug, whereas Carmen then gets saved by Rico. Yeah, standard action movie stuff. It's all very good, um, but it's a very simple plot. And the film ends with an advert sort of saying that the war is still ongoing and you can sign up today. Um, basically sort of turning the entire film into a recruitment tool by sort of highlighting that, you know, these characters are all still fighting. They're all still on the front line. Now, I really like Starship Troopers. It's... Paul Verhoeven is a, a pretty good director. I think he's, he's a very slick director. Uh, you know, there's a reason why things like Robocop and uh, Total Recall are still very well regarded, and why things like Basic Instinct are very well regarded. Um, and I think he does a very good job directing Starship Troopers. It's a lot of the action scenes are very good. Um, Phil Tippett, who worked on Jurassic Park, helped create the CGI dinosaurs for the first Jurassic Park. He works on the bugs, and as a result, they look incredible. Um, and like I said, I, I still think their effects hold up. Um, the music is fantastic as well. Um, it's done by uh, Basil Poldoris. Um, who does a great job? He was the uh, he was also the um, composer for Conan the Barbarian, and his score in this is is beautiful. the The song that plays when they land on Clendathu, this rousing military march, is very very good, um, and probably one of my favorites in the whole film. And you know the cast is very good. Ray Zach's played by Michael Ironside, who does a great job. Um, you know, um, Patrick Muldoon playing Xander, he does a good job. Clancy Brown plays Zim, um, the drill sergeant during the training. He's probably the most memorable character in the whole thing, has some amazing quotable lines. Um, yeah, it's 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 a good film, I really enjoy it. Um, you know, and it's not an amazing, fantastic movie or anything. Like, I don't want anyone to think it's one of the best movies ever. But it is pretty good. However, it also released in 1997. And as I said, it's it's trying to parody a lot of the elements that it's presenting in a quite a straight way. Um, because that's the satirical nature that it's using. It's the same way something like Judge Dredd portrays its society. You know, the the comics of 2000 AD and Judge Dredd, and as extend to the Dredd films, show that world very straight. But the whole idea of that story is satirical. The whole idea of that world is satirical. Like, it's never presented as, this is a good thing. Like, there's a scene in this movie where, and it's one of the inter intercut scenes because there's bits of like news reports sort of intercut and then it comes up with the line would you like to know more which is one again another very very quotable line um and what that what this news story does is it says that someone committed a crime that morning was arrested that afternoon tried this evening no, he was he was arrested this morning for a crime he committed yesterday, tried this afternoon, and he will be executed this evening live on primetime. And it's like, that's so 
bizarre. That's that's like terrifying in a lot of ways. Like it really is. That's not something that should be lauded at all. <laughs> um you know, Paul Verhoeven actually said that he he wants people to come with the idea of like, are you are you crazy? Are these people crazy? Because this is meant to be an unsettling world. Like, we're not meant to be on the side of these people. We're not meant to think any of this is good. But at the same time, it does portray these these characters as heroes as they're fighting bugs. And uh, again, some of the ways they speak about the bugs is borderline racist, especially, again, in some of the news reports. Like, there's a bit where these there's two talking heads arguing, and one of them's like, maybe there are some bug that we haven't seen yet, some sort of thinking bug. And the other one's like, I find the idea of a bug that thinks offensive, and he almost spits the words. It's so ridiculous. Like, everything in it is kind of turned up to 11, and I, th- I think the fact that people missed that the first time round is bizarre. And it meant that this film, you know, like the original novel, had this controversy around it where people were like, you know, because this is a violent film as well. There's a lot of gratuitous gore effects. Um, and it's like, you know, and, and the, the, the characters, the, the actors are not great. Um but again, I think part of that is by design because, like I said, it it fits like the sort of film that this society would have made as a promotional tool. <laughs> and I think that's how it's presented if you watch the movie. Um, you know, some of them are good actors. Like, I've seen Denise Richards, Dina Mayer, uh, Patrick Muldoon. I've seen them all in other stuff. They're not bad actors. Um, but... Yeah, there's elements of this that are quite wooden. Um, And, you know, it had negative reviews. It had quite bad word of mouth. And the box office just dropped week on week. And it only earned $121 And the budget was $100 So that's not much. And, you know, it meant it was the 34th highest grossing film of the year. Which doesn't sound too bad until you remember that 1997 was a really good year for cinema like 1997 saw the release of titanic the full monty um goodwill hunting la confidential the fifth element um jurassic park the lost world liar liar as good as it gets men in black tomorrow never dies air force one um my best friend's wedding um bonnie brasco like as well as the star wars uh special editions like, 1997 was a really, really good year for cinema. And, you know, as a result, yes, it was only 34, but that's quite far down because so many of those other movies made so much money. You know, so much money. Um, you know, Titanic, for example, even in 1997, made 1.8 billion dollars. Jurassic, uh, The Lost World made 618 million dollars. Men in Black made 589 million dollars. You know, so something only making back like 10 million more than its budget that's not a successful film, not a bomb necessarily. It made its budget back but not as successful as it could be. Now, Starship Troopers did still spawn a franchise. It had media tie-ins, it had toys, it had, I think it even had a video game um, and some other stuff going on at the same time. And, you know, Starship Troopers had brand recognition. So a lot of these things carried on and they led to a franchise. And a multimedia franchise at that, it got a TV show as well as films. Now, again, not all of the films are great. The TV show is. um, It's an animated television series called Roughnecks. uh, Roughnecks Starship Troopers Chronicles. And it's much closer to the books 
to the book in a lot of regards um because uh, while the while the CGI animation in it isn't great necessarily, like I, it's not bad, um, but what it does do is it was created for syndication, so it had a higher episode count, and it tried to divide all of the episodes into five episode story arcs. The problem was it was kind of rushed, and it meant that a lot of the series, a lot of the series, aired out of order. Um, you know, because th- episodes weren't finished yet. Because the idea is you'd run one storyline a week for eight weeks, and then it would be concluded. Um, and, you know, some of the final episodes weren't finished. Some of the other episodes had to be clip shows. Yeah. And it's a shame, because from what I know about it, it was, uh, the, what I have seen of it, it was great and the ending had some great potential like each campaign focuses on a different planet like the first one is based on pluto because they think the bugs come from pluto in this and then they learn they come from elsewhere so then you go to these other worlds like hydora and Tophet and tesca and eventually clendathu and then finally on earth itself And they end up fighting the skinnies. Like, they bring in the skinnies from the novels. They bring in the power armor. And it was good. It was a lot of fun. Um, So, yeah, I think that is a a good series. And I think that is worth your time. It's quite hard to track down now on DVD. Um, A lot of the DVDs are out of print and have been for a long time. But they were all released on DVD with each of the campaigns sort of edited into a single movie quite good um i i have the dvd for the pluto campaign somewhere but again they were released very slowly they they were released months apart (laughs) um the films though there's five no four sequels that all went straight to straight to home video um Starship Troopers Hero of the Federation is very, very low budget, like ridiculously low budget and almost kind of takes like an alien approach where it's like only a few bugs and the people are kind of trapped in and it's kind of claustrophobic, features no returning characters from the original. And I think one of the actors returns, but no characters returning. Starship Troopers 3 Marauder came out in 2008. Um, So Starship Troopers 2 came out in 2004. Marauder came out in 2008. Set several years further down the timeline. Chronicle uh, Roughnecks, by the way, came out in 1999. I don't know if I said that. Um, Marauder came out in 2008. Marauder is pretty good. Like, not great by any means but does feature the return of uh, Casper Van Dien, is written and directed by Edward Neumeyer, um, you know, which is something you, you can't say about the others. I don't think Neumeyer wrote, worked on any of the others, but he did work on Marauder. And Marauder is, again, trying to say something. It features, like I said, Casper Van Dien comes back as Johnny Rico. Rico is now a colonel. Um, it also stars Jolene Blalock, who played T'Pol in Star Trek Enterprise, and um, Boris Kodjo, who I've seen him in a few different things. The main thing I recognize him from is the Resident Evil film series. I'm not sure whether that's good or bad. I'm sure he's done way better work than that. Um, but he was he was quite good in that. He was in the fourth and fifth films, I believe. Um yeah, he was he was one of the more interesting characters, so it is a good ally for the character of Alice. Um But anyway, the the idea of Marauder that makes it a bit more interesting is that Marauder takes the approach of trying to say something by actually having a decent plot where the, the bugs are trying to win and trying to lead the human leaders into a trap. And then a religious element comes in and saves them. Like, to the point that this 
you know, fascist government now becomes uh, monotheistic and starts approaching like state sponsored worship almost. Um, yeah, it sounds bizarre and it kind of is, but it does work in the film. And I think it's the closest you're going to get to a proper sequel um, to the original. And nowhere near as good as the original, but still has some pretty good effects, has some pretty good actors, has a decent plot, and has the power armor. So it's like Marauder gives you the power armor, Roughnecks gives you the skinnies and the war story and a lot of the dark tension and focuses on the soldiers. So both of them work alongside the film to sort of enhance it, although Roughnecks is a different continuity. But still. Um, and then there's two other films that follow, um, both of which are sort of co-productions with Japan, and they're sort of CGI anime type ones. There's Starship Troopers Invasion and Starship Troopers Traitor of Mars. Both of them feature Casper Van Dien returning as the voice of Rico, and Traitor of Mars also features Dina, Mar Dina Mayer returning as the voice of Dizzy, um, despite the fact that Dizzy died. It's kind of like a mental hallucination thing. I've not seen either of them. I've heard mixed reviews. like Not necessarily bad, but you know, just perfectly fine for what they are. I think it's probably, again, to to compare to Resident Evil, probably similar to think of them to a lot of the, the animated movies that that's had recently, um, where there's a lot going on. And, you know, your mileage may vary depending on how invested you are in that franchise already. But... You know, I think the first film still holds up very, very well. So, you know, it was still successful, despite the sort of the lukewarm reception that the film had. The film has gone on to become, the franchise has gone on to become successful in its own regard. But it's the way it's been reappraised over the years that is the most interesting thing. Rico. Sir. I need a corporal. You're it until you're dead. Or do I find somebody better? Thank you, sir. Now, a lot of people have discussed um, why Starship Troopers performed, you know, performed the way it did at the box office. Um, you know, it didn't really connect with critics or audiences. Um, a lot of people missed out on the satire, and those that did get the satire and kind of appreciated it were then put off by other factors, such as the violence, the gore, um, the, the quite cheesy performances, the writing, the acting, things like that. Now, one of the other big things that may have prevented it connecting were there was already a lot of very good science fiction that released in 1997. Um, 1997 was a, a very good year for science fiction. Um, you know, we'd had The Lost World, the sequel to Jurassic Park, which had obviously been very hotly anticipated. Uh, Men in Black, which had done fantastically well. Fifth Element, which had done very, very well. Uh, and then, obviously, the Star Wars Special Editions as well. And, you know, Starship Troopers also came out a few weeks before some other big, highly anticipated films, including James Bond's Tomorrow Never Dies, Alien Resurrection, uh, Scream 2, and Flubber, which was obviously helmed with Robin Williams. And, obviously, a remake of a beloved film from back in the day. Now, American historian Robert Sklar also suggested that audiences had grown tired of um, science fiction adventure in general. Um, you know, the past year, the year previous to this, 1996, had seen the release of Independence Day, Mars Attacks, you know, the sort of the big budget alien war adventure films and then of course you know the release of star wars special editions earlier in the year 
you know, he, he was arguing that, you know, maybe we might be expecting a resurgence in war films based on like World War Two instead. And obviously, you know, there have been there's there's always World War Two films, you know, there's always films on World War Two uh, coming out. And, you know, there's been a few this year as well. <laughs> But the biggest issue was obviously that the film was accused of being pro-Nazi. You know, it was accused of being made by two Nazis. You know, Verhoeven and Neumeier were accused of Nazi sympathies and being called neo-Nazis. And Verhoeven himself said, you know, and this wasn't just normal people making this accusation. This was people like the Washington Post, (laughs) you know making this assumption and then obviously that caused you know the film to get bad press and then combine that with its release window and everything else like the fact titanic came out a few weeks after uh, afterwards as well which obviously went on to become the highest grossing movie ever at the time (coughs) you know is it any wonder that it didn't do well um Paul Verhoeven actually said you know it was tremendously disappointing um being accused of being a neo-nazi he said they couldn't see that all I have done is ironically create a fascist utopia um and obviously you know this narrative then got picked up by a lot of European publications including Germany Italy France and Verhoeven described it as being extremely punishing um, because he had to repeatedly explain to European journalists the idea that the film was using this imagery, this fascist imagery, ironically. Um, but, you know, there was this this very strong belief that this is what was dissuading audiences from turning out to see Starship Troopers. And then, of course, the people just not getting it and having the, the poor word of mouth from the audiences that did go. And, you know, the US box office dropped 50% in its second weekend. That's rare, even nowadays, to see a drop that large, but especially rare at the time. And, you know, everything was blamed, Not not just the imagery in the film, but also the title. Like, some people were saying, you know, this title leads audiences to expect something akin to a light-hearted adventure film like Star Wars instead of a film about fascism. Um, you know, audiences criticised the fact that Dizzy died rather than Carmen because they, they much preferred Dizzy to Carmen. Um, and Verhoeven remarked and said, we were trying to be good feminists by having the strong female character of Dizzy die and not killing off Carmen. But, of course, audiences connected with Dizzy. They didn't connect with Carmen. And, you know, that's very true in the movie. I think you agree that Dizzy and Rico have much better chemistry than Rico and Carmen do. And then, of course, there was the fact that some people just didn't know how to market this film. Um, Verhoeven himself actually criticised the marketing, saying that, you know, in the US it was marketed as an action film, um, which meant that people did overlook the satire because they weren't expecting it. Um, But there was speculation that, well, satire films don't perform very well. Maybe it was a deliberate choice by the studio. But... Verhoeven himself actually remarked that apparently it was appropriately marketed as a satire in the UK and did quite well as a result. Now, you know, it came out on video and DVD and obviously did fairly well and, like I said, carried on building steam and becoming a franchise. There was even a toy line um, and obviously toy lines for R-rated movies aren't unheard of but obviously some retailers like walmart and target were quite hesitant to stock them um but toys are us did um and you know they did well and then there was board games and other things and then all the franchise stuff that i mentioned before but the interesting thing is how the film has been adopted and explored since its release um 
and I think it's it's the the deep analysis of the film's themes and you know taking that into an account that has led to this critical reassessment of the film. You know, um, looking at you know how it handles politics and propaganda, how it handles uh, the idea of citizenship and violence. And how, you know, you have to admit, how it dissects what is presented in the novel and satirizes it and parodies it and holds it up and points at it and laughs at it in a lot of ways. This film is openly laughing at the source material. And that is what makes this good. So that is what I really want to dig into. So, the theming of Starship Troopers. Now, as I said, the novel's themes include patriotism, uh, militarism, colonialism, um, and elements of authoritarianism and xenophobia. Okay? Paul Verhoeven interpreted Heinlein's novel, you know, taking those themes and interpreted it as nationalistic, totalitarian, fascistic, in favour of military rule, you know? And these are all things that were very anti- antithetical to his beliefs. Um, Paul Verhoeven had childhood under the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands during World War II. And so he decided he wanted to use this film adaptation of Starship Troopers to not only deconstruct the themes of presented in the novel, but also to undercut them. Okay? So, you know, the the United Citizen Federation um, in the film, Starship Troopers, uses um, iconography and symbols that are direct allegories to the ones used by uh, the German Nazis, but also the Italian National Fascist Party. Mussolini's party um you know the flag which has an eagle um resembles the one on the Nazi coat of arms the officer uniforms in the um in the film uh resemble those worn by the Nazi secret police like Carl turns up towards the end of the movie dressed like almost like a Gestapo officer like he looks like he stepped off the set of a lower low (laughs) it's very weird um you know, the infantry uniforms have a symbol that looks very similar to the one that Mussolini's black shirts wore, you know. Um, now, Ed Neumeyer didn't help with this when he said that um, part of the reason why they used Nazi-like uniforms was because, quote, the Germans made the best-looking stuff. And I get what he's trying to say, but there are so many better ways of phrasing it. I mean, the Nazi uniforms were designed by Hugo Boss. Like, Hugo Boss designed the SS uniforms. So, yes, it's fashionable. Hugo Boss went on to become a this huge fashion designer. Still a fucking Nazi. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people forget that, I think. Um, so, yeah, there is a strong aesthetic to the Nazis but Verhoeven wanted to use that aesthetic in an artistic way Um, but this is part of what may have backfired um, because this is what led contemporary critics and audiences to consider the film to be an endorsement of fascism and this meant that Verhoeven had to state Whenever you see something that you think is fascist, 
you should know that the filmmakers agree with your opinion. Which I think is a, a great quote. He's just basically saying, yeah, we think it's fascist too. That's why we did it. And that works. Like, that's bold. Um, other aspects of the Nazi regime that they used for iconography in Starship Troopers, they use um, the architecture of Albert Speer. Um, they use the sort of the propaganda film stylings that you sort of saw in uh, Lenny Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will and Olympia. Um, you know, the very first scene of the movie um, is an advert for the mobile infantry. And it basically emulates scenes from Triumph of the Will. It even includes the dialogue, I'm doing my part. And it's like, that that was in Triumph of the Will. <laughs> you know? Um, and Verhoeven deliberately emulated all of these themes so that he could deliberately portray the protagonists as fascists. And it's like, that is so brazen it's it's he's deliberately sabotaging this work that he has been asked to adapt and i think it's beautiful how he's done it you know he he's cast um you know attractive young white actors conveying you know the aerial ideal of be aryan ideal of beauty as uh entertainment weekly described them um so that he could seduce the audience almost into joining the the you know sympathizing with the federation to to want to be part of their society but then sort of ask the audience like well what are you really joining up for what 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 are you what are you identifying in this this world that you want to be a part of and that's it's great because, like I said, that is such a deconstruction of what is in the original novel. Because the original novel is like, you know, you want to be a part of this. You want to be a soldier. You want to be a part of the military so that you have the rights of a citizen. And it's, you know, this one's like, well, why? Why do you need to do this to be that? Why do you want to be one of these people? Look at them. Look how cartoonishly evil in some cases they are. Like, not a, a moustache-twirling evil, but a very insidious cruelty, um, you know, for the Federation in the film. There's also um, one of the things I, I don't think I mentioned about um, Rico in the book. Um, Rico's revealed at the end of the book to be Filipino, um, and it's a deliberate choice that's revealed at the end of the novel. Um and it's designed to make readers empathize with him before revealing that he's not actually white. And obviously, like I said, this book came out in the 50s, so that's why it was done. Um, but, you know, like I said, it didn't work on me because I didn't empathize with Rico <laughs> in the first place when I read the book. Um, so Verhoeven chose to deliberately satirize this by making Rico white. Um, and like I said, you know, he still grew up in Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires is a very multicultural city. And, you know, there's, but the, you know, the predominant race there is not white. It's, you know, Hispanic. Everyone there, everyone in this film is white. <laughs> you know, there's a few black people here and there, but most people are white. Um, you know, there's a couple of, couple of Asians and a couple of blacks, you know, enough to fill the diversity quota. Um, you know, that America likes to put in its films. Um, you know, so it's not completely white, completely fascist. <laughs> um, there's also influence taken from uh, an essay from 1975 by Susan Sontag. And I found this, I thought this was quite a good source. Um, the book is called Fascinating Fascism, Fascisms. Uh, and it identifies the key aspects of Nazism, such as the idea of there being a cult of beauty and a fetish, fetishism of courage and uh, a sort of uh, repudiation of the intellect, the idea of serving the community at the expense of the self. And obviously so much of that forms the backbone of the, the attitude in this regarding society and how this how the federation works 
you know. Um, and like I said, this sort of stuff has gone on to be reappraised over the years. You know, Entertainment Weekly and the AV Club um, both mentioned over the years that they believed the filmmakers considered the main characters to be, like, pretty and stupid. Um, but they said that the film's best joke probably lies in Rico not being very intelligent, but as a result of not being intelligent, becoming the ideal citizen. He becomes the perfect blunt instrument, as they described him, for the war against the Arachnids. You know, he he completely abandons any of his own hopes and dreams outside of military life. You know, he wanted to just join the mobile infantry for a minimum term of service. And he was doing it so that he could be a citizen alongside Carmen, who he wanted to marry because he had this, you know, this is high school sweetheart. But, you know, she's talking about becoming career and breaking up with him and he becomes dejected and then he gets someone killed and he wants to quit. And then the bugs kill his parents and he becomes all out soldier determined for revenge you know um yeah it's very very clever a real kind of stripping away of him as a character and turning him into not just like an action movie cliche but a weapon like rico in this is a gun you know he's a gun pointed by the federation that's in the shape of a hero. Like, Carl actively uses him to save Carmen at the end of the film um, so that he can capture... so it can lead to the capture of the brain bug. You know, Carl psychically manipulates him to do this. You know, so so Rico is a weapon. He's not a person. Um... And like I said, there's a lot of propaganda in this, um, and it's depicted through the FedNet. Um, and the the FedNet scenes are probably the most memorable scenes in the whole movie, and they're eminently quotable. Um, you know, they show things like uh, children holding weapons or stamping on cockroaches, and adults like cheering them on. Uh, and then there's slogans like "Join the mobile infantry and save the world" or "Service guarantees citizenship," and it's it's the most trite, obvious war propaganda. Um, you know, the, the it makes me think of that that Simpsons episode um, where they're saying like join the navy backwards, and it's it's like they can't do such overt uh, recruitment ads. The the ads in this from the FedNet they're they're so. Um, they, they are blatant recruitment. And it's like, some of them don't even make sense. Like, they're clearly, obviously lying. Like, there's 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 one where they reveal that the, the asteroid that hit Earth and destroyed Buenos Aires, they say it came from Clendathu, and it was shot by bug plasma. Um, and it's like, you know, we see it in Counter the Roger Young earlier on, so we know it's like a big rock hurtling through space, but it's like, then they show a map and they show that Clendathu is on the opposite side of the galaxy to earth. You know, how long ago would the bugs have had to fire that rock for it to hit earth? You know, isn't it more likely that just a random asteroid hit earth, devastated Buenos Aires, killed hundreds of thousands of people, possibly millions of people, and, you know, the Federation decided to use that as an excuse to go to war against the Arachnids, who have already been bothering them on the colonies. You know? It's... It's really clever. It's like, is that... Like, there was a writer, Darren Mooney, he considered that that to be the FedNet and the way it's been used, to be prescient of, like, fake news which has obviously become so prominent recently. You know, it's got, it's presenting the stories that people want the populace to see, like the government and, and people with influence want the populace to see. And it's one of those, like, any news story you read has an agenda. 
Um, not a lot of it is overt propaganda. There are some things that still are news. But no news is unbiased. Everything has a bias to it. Um, and it's like some things over the past few years, I hope I hope people realise this, everything has a bias. Um, you know, if you don't know, if you think something is unbiased, that's because you agree with its bias. <laughs> you know, if you think something is particularly biased, it's because you disagree with its bias. That's how that works. Everything is biased. There is no unbiased sources. Um, and so... The, the the only unbiased things you have are just cold hard facts but even then you can present the facts in a way that they are biased <laughs> you know and I, I hope people realize that because that's so much of the modern era unfortunately so you have to think you know every time you see something what is what is it trying to say what is it trying to make you feel what is it what reaction is it trying to instill in you and what agenda could the person creating it have like this is how you objectively judge things and you know so much bias and agenda pushing has started to happen in media um, and I mean, obviously, there's the obvious ones like GB News, Fox News, um, you know, Brexit, Trump, all these things that we can we're very obviously these people are pushing an agenda. But literally everything, things like, you know, Murdoch's Sky News, you know, pushes an agenda. And, you know, a lot of the stuff, especially on the, on the part of the right, it you know, emphasizes patriotism and duty while giving you this illusion of choice and enlightenment with the the most iconic phrase of the, the FedNet things, which is, would you like to know more? It teases you and then says, would you like to know more? And then the best bit about this is, except for one instance where it shows you other stories, like sort of in the middle of the film, after the would you like to know more, every FedNet one ends. It says, would you like to know more? We never get to see more. We get that surface level, you know, of each story. The, the, even the one in the middle, it presents different stories. It doesn't elaborate on the story that it's presented to us. It presents us different ones instead. But each time, the 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 fed net in the film doesn't elaborate as it says would you like to know more because if we're taking the approach of we are the people in the populace we don't want to know more we're already sold we've already swallowed the kool-aid on it you know you know we've already been indoctrinated by the slogans and the propaganda and what we've been presented relating to the arachnids and it's already provoked at that response in us, that xenophobia. And, you know, it's gone and convinced the heroes of the film that their cause is righteous. And, you know, the arachnids are, are less than them and worthy of extermination as a result. You know, the only good bug is a dead bug. There's no peace is never presented as an option, just all out war. You know, this is a society, um, as the AV Club said, that has is presented in a way that it, it's been convinced to trade away its freedoms, its rights, and its identity for security from this alien threat. It's very clever. Um, and obviously, a lot of this as well also came about from Verhoeven's own response to events that he was perceiving in late 90s politics, um, such as limited gun restrictions, um, you know, an increase in capital punishment. Like, there was a lot of call for harsher capital punishments and more states to readopt the death penalty. Um, and, you know, it's, it's bad enough with the amount of shootings that we got, but there were some massive shootings in the 90s, and, you know, I mean, I know things like Sandy Hook and um, Ulvade have been so much worse. 
And obviously each one is a tragedy, but, you know, I think Columbine was around this time, if not a little bit earlier. And, you know, that was one of the biggest. It wasn't the only one. You know, and and people, every time, every time someone suggested a gun control restriction, you know, the right would balk at it because of the money and power that they got from the gun lobby. And, you know, Verhoeven's argument was that his, his belief was that all of this could eventually result in open fascism. And, you know, films at the time that were glorifying US military forces and depicting this really casual attitude to violence. Like, wasn't Black Hawk Down around this time as well? Um, I, I believe so. I mean, I can't, it's not my sort of movie, so I haven't really watched it. But I, I remember movies like that and movies like and, and other action movies like The Rock and um you know with with Nicolas Cage and uh things like Con Air where you know Nicolas Cage's main character is a, is a, a former army ranger and the rangers are presented as like the best military group um you know it, all of that is there and it's what um you know all, so many films have this like real casual attitude to violence and and glorifying the military and i mean a lot of films still do i'm not saying it's unique to military films but i think there's there seems to be a trend nowadays in trying to sh also show the consequences of violence you know things like marvel's civil war um you know, or you know, where where we we see the people that get hurt, we see the people caught in the crossfire, and obviously, and and you know, it's not just mindless action. Or if it is mindless action, we don't want to see that violence being done against people. You know, to to really root for these heroes, we want them to be you know, a faceless horde. I mean, not always. It's not perfect. And there's still a lot of violent stuff out there. You know, movies, video games, things like that. So it's not perfect. But hopefully, it's improving. One uh, strong allegory that Entertainment Weekly actually um, drew similarities to between Starship Troopers was the action film Top Gun. And they said that uh, Top Gun follows very physically strong, young, attractive Navy pilots fighting against this vague enemy. And then obviously there's other action films from the 90s, such as Independence Day, which was the year before, uh, Air Force One, which was the same year, um, which are also dripping in the same American jingoism and the same really pro-military message. Um with both films having this, you know, US president as a main character who is able to take this active role in the action towards the end of the film because of their military backgrounds. And then obviously, the, oh, the big one from the 90s that I always remember as being, um, he played so many military officers was Steven Seagal. Like, I think pretty much every character he played was a military officer, weren't they? Uh, you know, and things like Under Siege. Um, and, you know, glorification of police and, and things like that. We don't tend to have that much anymore, the, the glorification of the police and the military. There are still military and police films, but I think so many films now, we either focus on superheroes, uh, rebels and freedom fighters, or, you know, in terms of fantasy films, um, or I think we try and focus on the real people. And I think I prefer that rather than soldiers and cops. You know, as much as I like some of these films, you know, I like Independence Day. I like Starship Troopers. But I think we have learned over the past few years, you know, since 9-11, the war in Iraq, uh, George Bush, the way, the way that sort of that jingoism and that military industrial complex was kind of 
used to create so much suffering and remove so many controls from people and create such this this horrible domineering influence over society you know that is the sort of stuff that would mean that this film probably wouldn't get made today <laughs> or, or if it did i think people would pick up on the satire straight away i don't think it would be any question that this film is satirical if it was released today you know and this is this is even without you know the you know that's just the, the theming there's also the themes around um you know that's just themes of the politics and the propaganda there's the theming around the citizenship and the violence you know in the society depicted in the film um so many of the rights that people hold nowadays to be sort of true and inalienable to us they're reserved only for citizens you know they're restricted to ordinary civilians you know there's this the scene in the boot camp where they're all in the shower the, the, one of the most famous scenes in the whole film uh, which uh, fun fact paul verhoven actually agreed to film naked with them um so that they weren't the only ones naked which i thought was quite quite cool um but yeah um you know what's that what's that thing and any manager should shouldn't ask someone to do something they're not willing to do themselves um but yeah um but you know they they list their reasons for enlisting and you know one of them wants to serve as a politician one of them wants to go to harvard and can't afford it so he wants a scholarship um one of them wants to have children and she mentions how it's easier to get a license when you've been a citizen so you need a license to have children um one of them just doesn't want to work on a farm one of them wants to be a reporter like he he wants to actively write as a reporter which suggesting that you know reporters and obviously their teacher is uh is uh radcheck's uh radcheck is their teacher so he was a, a a veteran so he's a citizen so it's the idea like do do those sorts of jobs need to be um you know, do those sorts of jobs need to be served by veterans? You know, only citizens can have those sorts of jobs because that's interesting as well. And, but, you know, these are options that nowadays, you know, in a democracy, we believe are typical. You know, we can have kids, we can do whatever job we want, provided we're skilled enough to do it. Um, You know, I know America's a bit screwed up, but it's like, you know, if we wanted to serve as a politician or, um, you know, to to attend higher education or, or move away from a different job, we have those rights. But in this world where the military government controls the planet, they have to be earned through military service. Even voting is presented as an act of force. You know, um, they, they describe it as the supreme authority a right that has to be taken instead of given. You don't just get given the right to vote. You have to earn the right to vote. You have to take it as a citizen. Um, you know, Radshek even tells the students, violence has resolved more conflicts than anything else in human history. He says, the contrary opinion that violence doesn't solve anything is merely wishful thinking at worst. You know, it's it's so pessimistic. <laughs> you know, this this society is is broken. Um, you know, even even things like how how that was received. It's like the the nudity in the shower scene was the thing that was criticised and questioned. And Verhoeven actually said, "Well, that criticism is hypocritical. You're saying it's easier to depict extreme violence in films without censorship." Because there's a lot of violence and gore in this film. Um, but you're saying it's easier to depict that than nudity. But, you know, he was he was conveying in that scene that despite the fact the characters are all naked, um, they don't comment or react to the fact they have no libido. It's been completely suppressed because of their dedication to service, to their careers, and to the state. 
you know, and, you know, and this is a mixed, mixed gender group as well. You know, it's men and women, a lot of them young men and women, but they have no libido. In fact, I think the only illusion, there's only a couple of illusions to sex, really, in the whole film. It's like um, after their, their graduation where Carmen says her parents aren't home, and then when Dizzy and Rico actually sleep together. And that's it. So, yeah. In fact, the... Um, Although humanity in the film kind of gets presented as victims of the threat, um, you, you know, of the arachnids, aspects of the film actually probably reveal that humanity probably instigated the conflict. Like, they invaded and colonized, colonized sorry, uh, arachnid worlds. Like, one of the actual Fednet um, bits features, um, like, a Mormon colony um, out on the frontier that sort of landed there and then got destroyed, like killed, all, all of them horrifically killed um, by the arachnids. And it's like they would have just settled on this arachnid planet and the arachnids would have killed them. You know, the 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 asteroid that strikes Earth is used to justify this full-scale war. Like the the landing of Clendathu, where the, they drop the mobile infantry. Like there's so many ships in orbit. There's all these drop ships coming down. There are hundreds of extras running around as the troops. Um, you know, hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Like they mention millions died. You know, fighting this war. So this is this you know, thousands at least. So this is a huge army that they threw at Clendathu. Um, you know, it's, and it's kind of presented almost as like their version of like Passchendaele in terms of how many people they lost. Um, but yeah, it's just the, this cycle of war um, where, you know, the, the propaganda presents this through the FedNet to the youth to make them want to sign up, to become emboldened by all the slogans and all the propaganda so that they join the infantry and become this readily disposable soldiers. You know, this is this is like Warhammer's Imperium of Man level recycling of the army. You know, uh, it's all propaganda to bring in new recruits. And, you know, clearly this sort of stuff worked because this is the sort of things that would have inspired... Um, you know, Rico and, and the others to join in the first place. And then, of course, we see it in action, you know, um, towards the end of the film when the Roughnecks have lost, like, a whole load of soldiers, um, you know, including a load of their veterans and, you know, the lieutenant. And Rico's now the lieutenant. Um, Ace is with him as squad leader. And um, Sugar, I think, is the other one, Sugar Watkins. And they get reinforced. And there's like about 50, 60 new soldiers. And the line from Lord of the Rings comes in where it's like, they've seen too few winters. You know, these these are kids. They are fresh out of boot camp. You know, and, and Rico makes this smug line about it. We're turning to Ace and saying, we're the old men. And it's like... You literally just graduated, <laughs> you know, you graduated boot camp a month ago, if that. <laughs> you you were sent straight to the front. You know, and then the soldiers get given orders to just kill anything inhuman. Like, the, you know, the soldiers call each other apes. It's like, come on, you apes, you want to live forever. And, you know, it's apes and bugs, apes versus bugs. And it's like the ape thing comes from the book because it's like they're called apes because that's how they look in the power armor. Um, but it's obviously, it doesn't really translate to the film. But it's like they kept the line, but it then becomes this, you know, ape good, bug bad kind of thing. You know, you see anything with more than two legs, you kill it. Um, and, you know, they have failures. They're a strategic failures on the part of the mobile infantry and the way they solve it is they just send more soldiers you know <laughs> um 
writer Lloyd Farley, he said uh, he considered the the gory and the explicit scenes with the dead, like including the 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 FedNet one where it's showing the dead colony members. It's like this is the warning to stay away from bug space. Don't go colonize in bug space, you know, by showing these graphically mutilated corpses on the news, you know, and it's it's being intended to overtly display the horrors of war in a society that's already dedicated to conflict. <laughs> like this, this society, the Federation is so devoted to the idea of the war and the warfare. And, you know, even on planet P, they have all these deaths, so many deaths, like the, the roughnecks get attacked there. So many of them get killed. Um, you know, Dizzy dies, uh, Radchek dies, and they're not the only ones. And then, then obviously, all the people that were there stationed there originally on Planet P at the at the base, they're all quickly forgotten. You know, they're forgotten because uh, obviously there's that, and then then they mount this huge offensive on P because it's like, well, they they realise that's where the brain bug is. And loads more of them die. But it's like, oh no, forget all that, because we've captured the brain bug. And this could lead to the end of the war. But the end of the war isn't the conclusion of the movie. The conclusion of the movie is, they captured the brain bug. And it might end the war. Probably won't, but it might. You know? And... <sighs> You know, even even the, the violence in the film even gets rewarded, like actively rewarded. Like Rico becomes a lieutenant throughout the course of the movie, starting as a cadet, right? How does he get these promotions? Because the people above him get killed. <laughs> you know, he gets a Klingon promotion. The people above him die. He gets field promoted, you know? You know, he gets promoted to squad leader, you know, at boot camp. He gets um, promoted to corporal because Radchek needs a corporal because the corporal gets killed. Also, by the way, how awful is their armor? Like, not in terms of the, the look, like the, the, the suits that they were using for the armor get used quite a lot get, again. Like, they get reused in at least one season of Power Rangers that I know about, Firefly, and a couple of other things. So these suits come back. So the suit design is obviously pretty good for, like, you know, fascistic, stormtrooper, space soldier type people. But, but, how terrible is it? Because who was this armor made for? Because if you watch the film... Every one of their guns can shoot through that armor pretty much effortlessly. Like, there are multiple instances where one of the troopers will kill, like a mercy kill, one of their, one of the other soldiers. And it's like, because th that's how Radchek dies. Radchek gets horrifically wounded. He's like, Rico, you know what to do. Rico kills him. You know, a single shot, bang, dead. And it's not even like a shotgun blast or anything. It's just a normal shot. But then it's like, this armor doesn't even block the bugs. Like, the bugs stab right through it with, like, their appendages. So it's like, what is this armor actually for? Who does it protect? <laughs> you know, this is ridiculous. And then, yeah, the final part of the culmination of the movie, the final joke in it, is... The surviving characters, the protagonists, so um, specifically Carmen, Ace, and Johnny, right? Everyone they've lost, you know, they've lost Xander, they've lost Dizzy, um, Carl's off doing, you know, military, you know, secret military nonsense, so it's like they're not with him either. But, you know, they've lost the lieutenant, they've lost so many people. and. How do they decide to deal with it? You know, do they disagree with the system? Do they choose to fight against it? No. They become such deeply ingrained cogs in the machine that the final FedNet piece of the movie is 
an outright recruitment ad. It is recruitment propaganda. It says you too can join, you know, you know, the Federation forces, enlist today, and you could serve like Captain Carmen Abanez, Lieutenant Johnny Rico, squad leader Ace Levy. And it's like they're showing you what you could be. You could be these characters. These characters are now recruitment propaganda to enlist the next generation of troops. And this is why I, I believe as well that in-universe Starship Troopers, as it is presented in the film, as the film is presented, is an in-universe propaganda piece. Like, And I think that was Paul Verhoeven's goal, is that this looks like the exact sort of propaganda tool that the Federation would have created. And it's that final scene that nails that for me. You know? That final scene shows this is why this film exists. This film tells this story with these, these uh, you know, attractive, um, but, you know, almost two-dimensional heroes that are more character archetype than character. <laughs> Because the whole thing is a propaganda film. Like, this is the Federation's version of Triumph of the Will or Olympia. It is, this is how it's designed to look. And maybe the other FedNet pieces are are real throughout the course of the movie. But it's like, this is how it's, it's so clever. And, and that's part of what really sold me on it. Um, you know, even as a kid, like... I mean, I, I mean, I was, when I first saw it as a kid, I was like, I was drawn in by the, you know, the violence, the guns. You know, I was, I was a stupid kid once as well, and I had no taste of stuff. But the reason why I've kept watching this and the 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 things that have come to me as I've carried on watching it is that unlike something like Independence Day, which is doing that jingoism very straight. Like, Independence Day is trying to be this very patriotic movie. And I've spoken before about how sometimes I think that really works, and sometimes it becomes almost laughable. But this is deliberately doing that, but in a way that is satirizing the whole thing. And it is fantastic. And I am so here for it. <laughs> and that is what has led to the change in how this film is appraised. Here in the AQZ knows exactly when the invasion of Thandafu will occur, but everyone's talking about it, and the talk says tomorrow. Here's a bunch of MI kids that look like they could eat bugs for lunch. <laughs> yum, yum, yum. So, Trooper, you're not too worried about fighting the arachnids? Hey, shoot a nuke down a bug hole, you got a lot of dead bugs, now, I just right? hope it's not over before we get some. <laughs> some say the bugs were provoked by the intrusion of humans into their natural habitat, that a live and let live policy is preferable to war with the bugs. Let me tell you something. I'm from Buenos Aires, and I say kill them all! Yeah! Oh, yeah! 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 Oh, yeah! So, despite the initial negative reception, that Starship Troopers had. It's now considered one of the better science fiction films ever made, really. Um, it's done nothing but grow in esteem since it was released. And obviously it was released, like I said, 25, 26 years ago nearly. Um, and all these, you know, analysis, the, the, the retrospective analysis have come and described it now as among one of the most subversive and probably one of the most misunderstood big Hollywood studio films um, that's been made. You know, it was it was undermined by critics and audiences who misinterpreted this anti-fascist satire as an actual endorsement of a fascist utopia. You know, but... You know, you've now got people like The Verge and The Atlantic describing it as, in hindsight, a really obvious satire that was probably just released at the wrong time. You know, the late 90s was an era of prosperity in the United States. Like, this is why the jingoism that's in um, something like Independence Day in 1996 was worn quite proudly. 
it's because America was doing well. This is part of why 9-11 was so shocking, because it revealed that America was vulnerable. And then, of course, how that led to um, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, which have obviously hurt the economy for decades afterwards. You know, and, you know, in this era, era of prosperity in the 90s, showing Americans that, showing American audiences that, the, you know, the criticism of their own society, they don't want to see that. That's not what they want to see. And so they may not have seen it, either deliberately or, you know, simply because they weren't looking for it. And obviously the marketing, like I said, was a problem. It presented Starship Troopers as this this typical science fiction film. Um, so it made it easy for people who weren't expecting the satire to completely misinterpret it, to get the completely the wrong end of the stick. Because, you know, the expectation you go into a film with from the trailer can sometimes make or break a film and what you think of it. There are ways to do subversive marketing to to not spoil a big twist or hide something. You know, Cabin in the Woods, which I spoke about a while ago, that did that. The trailers for that, you know, I think there's one trailer that kind of hints at the twist. But for the most part, it's it's kind of well hidden. You know? And obviously, other publications have argued that perhaps Starship Troopers was an example of Poe's Law, where the views in the film are presented to such an extreme that it becomes almost impossible for the audiences to understand if it's a parody or if it's serious. And I think part of the reason why the view on the film has continued to evolve is because obviously, in the decades since, we have had societal shifts. And that has changed the opinion of the film because now the satire is more obvious, you know, particularly in, um, you know, the 2010s where we started having this very heavy criticism of and critique of the right wing militarism, the military industrial complex, the sort of reactionary violence and, uh, and, and the American jingoism, you know. America was not popular in the 2010s around the world. You know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of Americans even that didn't really like their own government and their country. They weren't proud of who they were then. And it made the satire a lot more noticeable. You know, David Roth for The New Yorker, in uh, a retrospective in 2020, he argued that Starship Troopers' message had become more meaningful over time because it presents a narrative in which humanity, built on a culture of fascism and violence, which obviously w are on the rise, like they are on the rise, as much as people like to think that, you know, we've got rid of Trump, so... You know, we're sort of behind it. We're not. There are so many hardcore fascists out there. But despite this society being built on fascism and built on violence, like violence earning you rights, violence against others earning you rights to exist, to have children, to have the job you want, to vote... Even with all that, this is a society that gets its ass kicked. That was the exact quote he used. It gets its ass kicked. And though, and then its only solution is to inflict more violence. Quite often to very little success. You know, he further contrasted the, the culture of the violence um, to you know, at the time, very contemporary police brutality against peaceful protests or, um, you know, the government attempts to defeat COVID-19 through just, like, sheer force of will, you know, because that's how the Federation government acts 
in the movie. We're better than the bugs, so we will win. We have to win. We're better. Why are we not winning? You know? And obviously, you know, since 2020, none of this stuff's gone away. You know, the 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 right-wing governments around the world, not just in America, but Britain as well, and other places, and how poorly they've handled the the pandemic, the resulting ep- economic fallout from the pandemic. Um, and obviously just growing civil unrest and, ri- like I said, rising fascism. You know, go, just take a stroll onto Twitter sometime. Or actually don't, Twitter's awful. It's becoming almost like a... Like a domesticated 4chan. But with wine mums who have concerns, which is so much more insidious than just outright fascism. You know, and a lot of the things that are presented in the film are a bit more overt, but it's presented in a way, as in a similar sort of way to the concerns that people have you know yeah the film's gone on to be looked on way more favorably by critics you know it's been considered now a cult classic an unsung masterpiece you know sci-fi called it riveting they said that it's undermined by poor acting even if it was intended and melodrama but apart from that it's riveting you know empire magazine called it the true spiritual successor to robocop's savage satire and gonzo violence and obviously robocop was directed by Paul Verhoeven. The satire that is in RoboCop, you know, that pervades that film, is all over Starship Troopers. You know? And it's now considered one of the best films of the 90s. You know, in terms of what it was trying to do and trying to say by a lot of critics. In fact, even in 2021, the British Film Institute named it one of the 10 greatest science fiction adaptations. That that reappraisal is huge, <laughs> you know. That's it's, it's it's become it's so different now in terms of how it's treated to how it was originally presented, and to the success or or lack of success that it found originally. And I love it. It's incredible. You know, and the the film has just continued because of this critical reassessment. It's just continued to generate interest. You know, because not only is it being critically reassessed, but it's also got elements that came to reflect almost future events. You know, the the destruction of Buenos Aires and the shock that that causes to the Federation. How similar is that to something like the September 11th attacks? Um, you know, the actions of the, the Federation government and the steps that it takes. How similar is that to um, the US government and George Bush convincing the American people to surrender liberties with things like the Patriot Act to... Um, you know, to to agree to an illegal war in Iraq, to to fight and defeat the enemies of, you know, peaceful, God loving American citizens. You know, so many retrospects of cap- retrospectives have capitalized on this throughout the 2010s and the early 2020s. I've described how, like I was saying, the rise in fascist activity has made Starship Troopers seem like a prescient warning rather than an outright satire. You know, AV Club said it was a, you know, it serves almost as like a brilliant dissection of wars and how propaganda can be used to justify 
young people being sent to the slaughter almost against this dehumanized enemy for the greater good. And, you know, the, this is off the back of, um, you know, other big science fiction films done by Verhoeven and other similar sort of satires with with things to say. You know, Total Recall and Robocop, his, his big sort of sci-fi trilogy. And, you know, I think the failure of Starship Troopers and... Um, Showgirls, and then the following Hollow Man as well, which came out in 2000, which, you know, he actually said, felt he lacked his own personal style on it because he acquiesced to all the demands of the studio. And, you know, between all those failures, Verhoeven just became disillusioned with the studio system in Hollywood and left and returned to Europe. And he went on to, to keep making good work and to keep earning acclaim for the works that he was making. You know, he did things like Black Book and L, which both have been very critically successful. But I think losing him as a filmmaker in America is, is a shame because I think the quality of the work he has made there illustrates that he's a bloody good filmmaker with a lot to say and a lot of interesting ways to tell a story and like i said even something like something that comes across as exploitative as showgirls and has its faults don't get me wrong it's not a good film by any means but there's elements of it that you can see what he's trying to do and you know, this film has carried on being successful. It's carried on pervading through the zeitgeist. Uh, in 2015, Casper Van, Di Casper Van Dien um, said, you know, you know, there's not been a week in my life since I did Starship Troopers where I can go down the street without someone shouting out Rico to me. People know who he is. People know Rico. You know, Denise Richards has actually said she, she loved playing the character of Carmen. She loved how people responded to the character and responded to her as the character. And of course, several big influential filmmakers have gone on to name this film as not just one of their favorite films, but also an influence on them. You know, um, Macaulay Culkin, Robert Rodriguez, um, Eli Roth, Quentin Tarantino, James Wan, Edgar Wright, you know, filmmakers who have made some incredible work, um, you know, and in, in some of them in a variety of genres. You know, Margaret Brown as well, Ari Aster, David Lowry. You know, they've, they've described this... this as a good film, one of their favourites, one of their influences. And a retrospective by The Guardian in 2020 suggested that with hindsight, um, Starship Troopers, Robocop and Total Recall don't just form almost like an unofficial science fiction action film trilogy by Paul Verhoeven, but sort of form a trilogy around authoritarian governance and how dangerous that can be, but also how subtle and pervasive it can be at the same time. And, yeah, I think this film has done very well. I hope it continues to do well. Uh, I hope it, more people come to it. And I hope if you've never seen it, you know, you're tempted to go and look at it. Maybe you've heard that it's just like this dumb, awful action movie. Now that you know it's satire, go and watch it. Go and watch it. Spot the satire. Spot the things that are being said by the characters. Because that's the, the real key and the real rub. 
is not just how these things are presented, but what is being said, and what is being presented by the film, what the film is saying. Because I don't think any of this has ever been portrayed in a good light. So yeah, I think it's a, a great film. I'm glad that it's had the reappraisal it has. I think it's deserved. So thank you, my friends, for joining me for that episode. Um, this is, like I said, it's one of my favourite films. It's one of, um, it's one I grew up with um, and thought was cool for a whole load of reasons when I was a kid, but have carried on to appreciate as I've gotten older in the, for a completely different reason. Um, you know, it, and you know, similar to Independence Day, which I've spoken about already. You know, I think there's a lot to like here. But a lot of what there is to like about this, I originally missed at the time. You know, I got caught up in the, you know, the sort of, the, not the fascism aspect. I was, I was too young for that. But like, or, or to really clue in on it. But just like the, the action adventure aspect. Like that bit worked for me as a kid, but the, but it also felt more sophisticated than just a standard action adventure film. And I think this is why it's continued to do well as a franchise, you know, and has had these other movies, has had, um, you know, comic books and video games and so much other things going on. In fact, it's like this this series has even had um you know there was there was an OVA adaptation years ago which I didn't even know about that's apparently a lot more accurate to the book and I think I might have to watch that at some point and and see if that's any good and I really want to rewatch Roughnecks and go through that cuz that is great so but yeah that's my view on Starship Troopers. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining me while I've, I've spoken about it. And, and like I said, I, don't, I just find that the way this film has been reappraised over the years quite fascinating because I always knew it kind of wasn't very popular despite it forming a franchise. But obviously it carried on continuing to resonate with me more and in different ways every time I watched it. And that's what kept me coming back to it. So seeing that I'm not unique in that regard and that other people have had that same realisation is great. And it's fascinating. And then it, it got me thinking of the why of it all. So that's what I discussed here. So yeah. Anyway, as always, I want you all to look after yourself your physical and mental health very very important please you know do what you can to look after yourself to take care of yourself to be true to yourself as best as you can as well and i wish you all all the best and until next time look after yourselves also, I've said Starship Troopers that many times now that while recording this, that now I have the song I Lost My Heart to a Starship Trooper stuck in my head. Is it a missed opportunity that that isn't in the film? I don't know, but I'm going to go listen to that now. Thank you, my friends, for once again joining me on Gardo Goes Geek. Your continued support for this podcast means the absolute world to me. And I am grateful for every single one of you who stays and listens to one of my episodes. It means the absolute world. Now, if you would like to engage more with me uh, or the podcast, we have a Discord community, small but growing. And, and we now have commissions open on Ko-Fi. So if there's a topic you would like to see me cover, you can pay me to cover it. All funds will be used for legal purchase of the relevant items where I do not have them. 
have a look on the link tree for more information. Until next time, look after yourselves. Thank you.